So um, we're going to talk about um, basically fossil first or traditional energy sources, and then we'll get into some alternative energy sources. And because this is supposed to be about all the energy sources in, you know, 28 slides in an hour or less, um, it's going to be a quick and dirty overview. So please don't use this as the like end all be all for these um, these sources of energy. Please look at the um, content in your course. Look at um, if you go to the energy um, review, the energy course resource um, document. The if you click like on the colored button at the top of the page in the home page. And go there if you scroll to the bottom it's got lots and lots of energy resources so please kind of look at all of that stuff don't use this as a um as an end-all be-all for energy um so in the 1800s um coal was basically the dominant fuel and it remained dominant until the 1940s um i read something the other day that we still use have about 50 percent in the united states of our energy comes from coal. So, you know, we're not away from coal by any means. And um, a lot of the developing countries use coal a lot because it's it's pretty cheap. Um, in the 1920s, it was about 80% of all of our energy in the US. So um, this is an actual picture of China. I don't know if you can like see it uh, because it's so um, cloudy with smog. But um, China is the world leading producer of coal. About 80% of China's electricity comes from coal, um, whereas 49% of our electricity comes from coal. Um, supply, we think, could last about 230 years. But what's interesting is we, we import, right, a lot of petroleum and oil and things like that for cars, but we actually export 5% of our coal production annually. So um, we actually produce more coal than we use in the United States. So some very briefly, some problems with coal, some health issues with coal. Um, there's something called black lung, which is short term for a uh, coal workers pneumococcus. Um, and it's basically from inhaling coal dust. You get that coal dust in your lungs. Um, Surface mining um, accounts for about 69% of our coal, and there's huge mining, huge impacts with surface mining, right? Um, there's a few ways that you can do surface mining. Um, none of them are really great for the environment. Um, there are some, there's called mountaintop removal, where they literally like dynamite mountains. Um, there are some where they just, you know, dig into the ground. Um, so all of those are going to have huge environmental impacts because, you know, whatever you had here is going to be gone, right? Um, and then if you've made any mess, that can kind of run off into streams and things like that. Um, and then there's a type of mining called underground mining where the, the um, surface impact isn't huge, but the underground impact is huge. Um, and so what if you if you cut out too much of the coal underground, you can actually um, you can have like cave ins, you can have fires. So underground mining is more dangerous than surface mining, but surface mining is going to disrupt the environment more. Um, and so with underground mining, they can only take about 50 percent of the coal because they have to leave some of it in place to support the roof of the mine. So the miners aren't crushed. Um, here's an example of strip mining. Um, they basically use dynamite to break up the surface layers. It's going to totally destroy the ecology of the region. If you can see in the picture, right, here's your mining. That looks very different from the, um, the trees below, right? So this is what would be somewhat intact ecologically. And then the mining area obviously looks nothing like it. Um, in addition, it can pollute the groundwater and waterways. So, um, you know, a lot of this mining stuff can, you know, run off into streams and rivers and kind of pollute that part that superficially looks like it hasn't been disturbed. Um, it can lead to erosion, acid leaching, and um, mine waste. Um, the, an example 
of um, is it of a company is the Massey Energy Company. They violated the Clean Water Act on at least 4,500 occasions. Um, they discharged mining waste and sediment into streams, which you're not supposed to do, and they just settled for $30 million, which for them is not very much at all. But you know, um, so why do why do we waste our time with this? It's dangerous. It disrupts the environment. Why do we bother? Well, um, coal power. Um, is cheap and it's easy. We've got lots of coal power plants around the United States. Um, a typical 1,000 megawatt power plant would burn 8,000 tons of coal a day. Um, that's tons. Okay, so that's going to release 20,000 tons of CO2. Remember, CO2 is not very heavy, right? So it's a gas, so 20,000 tons of CO2 is a lot of CO2 in 800 tons of SO2. And um, these are um, pretty intense air pollutants. And then you've got this waste, right? So once you burn the coal, you're left with this ash waste. And the waste, um, it get, generate about 1,600 tons a day. Um, that ash has to go in its own special landfill. You can't just take it to the regular landfill where like your house trash goes. It has to go to a special ash landfill um, because you know it has been on fire and things like that. So coal actually produces as much carbon dioxide as all cars and trucks in the United States. Um, you can see here we have um, coal plants. And then we have surface transport, which is basically like cars and things. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of CO2 being generated with coal. Like I said, it's cheap and easy. So let's talk about the pollution. We've already talked a little bit, but let's talk some more. Um, smoke and fumes from coal fires will increase air pollution. Um, it's hazardous to mine. It's dirty to handle. Uh, burning coal results in the ash that must be removed. It's um, so this this is just an example which I just included because I think it's kind of fun in a I don't know kind of morbid kind of way. Um, this is a place in Pennsylvania, and I literally had never heard of it before until I started teaching AP Environmental Science. And it's called Centralia, Pennsylvania. My husband had never heard of it before, um, and basically they were um, mining coal. And there was a mine fire. And what does a fire need to keep going? Fuel, right? Well, what is a coal mine? It's like a whole mine full of fuel. So this place caught on fire like years ago. They had to evacuate it. And it's still on fire. Like these are like current pictures of this place. And you can see that the ground is smoking. There's holes in the road. Um, they have these signs when you go near it. You can see the houses right here, right? Um, you can see where it's smoking and stuff right here. And then there's literally houses just a few streets away. And this is in the United States. And this is a coal fire, a mine fire that basically hasn't gone out yet. And they can't put it out. They just have to wait for it to go out. And so it's you know, it's still burning in Pennsylvania. It's kind of interesting. So now let's talk about oil. Um, crude oil was our dominant energy source by 1951. Um, it's about 40% of our total energy consumption and 34% um, of total annual global energy consumption. So it's it's impressive. Um, if you look at this nice little graph, it actually shows that the United States uses 50% of the oil in the world. Um, sorry, that was others. The United States is 25. Um, I'm not giving us as much credit. But still, we're, we're a quarter of the energy use in the, United, uh, in the world, of oil at least, and we are one country, right? We're not even the country that has the most people in it, right? We're just one country. So that's that's part of the thing where they say um, 
with increasing like richness or increasing um, per capita income, you're going to have more carbon or more ecological footprint. Um, so ways that um, oil can cause pollution. Um, it greatly improved the air quality, right? Because we're not having the smoke and the soot from burning coal, but we've got these other trade-offs, right? We've got, um, we have oil spills, um, uh, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that kind of thing. You're still gonna release SO2, those kind of things. So um, it's it's less pollution than coal, but it's it's not excellent. And we're, you know, there's not a ton of oil um, to go around. It is a fossil fuel. Um, the next fossil fuel is natural gas, and it's mostly methane. Um, and methane is uh, CH4. And so when you burn methane, it only produces carbon dioxide and H2O. So it's considered clean burning because it only produces CO2 and H2O. It doesn't produce any of those sulfur dioxides or nitrogen oxides or anything like that. So it's, it's considered to be better, even though it still produces CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. Um, about 24% of U.S. energy demand is natural gas, and 20.5% um, of global energy demand. And let me make sure I get this one right. This is the United States. This is Russia. I'm just writing it because it's kind of hard to see Canada. Iran. Norway. Everyone else. So you can see we, we use a lot of the natural gas too. This is 18.1% and this is 21.6. So we're not the, the most out of in each individual country, but when you combine that we use almost the most natural gas and almost the most um, oil, we're using a lot of fossil fuels in the United States. 16.5% um, of our natural gas is imported. Oddly enough, we get most of this from Canada. Um, and at the 2007 rate of use, our proven reserves in the United States are only going to last about nine years. Um, so that's 2007, um, and we are 2018 right now. Um, so that's what, like 11 years? So, hmm, something happened, right? We must have found more reserves or something. Um, worldwide, Almost four times as much gas is likely to be available as coal, as oil, um, but the problem is 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 a lot of it is really hard to get to. Um, you can see these large pipelines. These are usually natural gas pipelines. When you see these, um, it basically must be pumped via the large pipes or shipped in um, in large tankers in order to get where it needs to go. And something that's interesting that I learned when I visited the LNG terminal in Savannah is that um, there's only eight LNG terminals, liquid natural gas terminals, in the un entire United States. And this is from when I taught in Savannah. And we have one of them. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So overall, fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, they're all fossil fuels. Um, they are 86% of our energy consumption and 81% of worldwide consumption. Um, this one is oil. This is coal. This is natural gas. This black one is nuclear. Let's see. This is alternative energy and wood. And this blue one is water. But you can see oil, natural gas, and coal are heads and tails above the other types of energy sources.
So now let's talk about generating electricity or electricity. So electrical power is the amount of work done by um, an electric current over a given time period. Um, one megawatt will power about 800 homes on average. So like we talked about the 1,000 megawatt power plant, um, coal power plant, that would power what, like 800,000 homes. Um, an energy carrier is going to transfer the energy. And then your primary energy source is the original location of the energy. So like it all turns into electricity, but was it coal? Was it oil? Was it nuclear? What was it? Um, what was the energy source? So um, let's talk about alternatives and clean energy now. So um, our current electricity is not clean. Um, it is expensive and it's generated from fossil fuels and nuclear energy most of the time. Um, some people consider nuclear energy a alternative energy source because it's not a fossil fuel, but it's not what you would call like a clean energy source because you still have to mine uranium uh, produces um, large amounts of waste. And it still relies on like um, fossil fuels to to build them. Um, the only clean energy, this is energy that does not produce air pollutants or pollutants, is hydroelectricity, solar, wind, and biomass. Um, so just to keep that in mind. Um, now biomass will release CO2, but it's it's considered clean and renewable anyway because it's it's. You're burning current carbon instead of like old carbon. So it's, it's better for the environment. So when we talk about efficiency, um, the more efficient something is, the more bang for your buck you're going to get. So for example, um, if you are 95% efficient, you're getting more bang for your buck than if you're like 20% efficient, right? Um, so uh, electricity from fossil fuels is only about 30 to 35 percent efficient because um, we uh, we lose energy uh, pretty frequently, um, and so that's going to that's going to reduce our efficiency. So like for this one, we're putting in 188 joules and we're getting out 1.35 joules. That's not excellent, right? Um, so that's a that's an incandescent light bulb, um, which is you know why uh, you don't like the incandescent light bulbs or they've been kind of discontinued because you're you're losing they're very inefficient. You're about like um, an incandescent bulb will produce uh, ninety five percent heat, five percent light. Okay, now this one, this is a uh, fluorescent bulb. You're still producing 1.35 joules, but you're only putting in 47 joules, where in the other one you were putting in 188. So that's why we're switching now to uh, uh, CFLs, uh, compact fluorescent. And LEDs. LEDs is another new one that they're using. Um, and LEDs are even more efficient than CFLs. So um, these current energy sources produce something called thermal pollution, which you know we talk about air pollution, where you know if the air gets yucky, or we talk about water pollution, where the water gets yucky, or we talk about you know maybe even land pollution, where the land is getting yucky. But thermal pollution is actually pollution of temperature. And so what happens is this happens a lot in nuclear power plants. Um, basically, they're often built near waterways. And um, in order to cool the coils or to cool the core, they, they pump in water from the environment. And then um, it's used to cool the coils. The, the water heats up. And then they release the hot water back into the I mean, it's cool. It's, it's cooled a little bit, but it's still hotter than the natural water. Um, it's released, the hot water is released back into the environment, which um, the critters that live in that waterway 
they are adapted to a certain temperature and it's too hot there. So you'll see um, a lot of times you'll see in the waterways by a power plant, you'll see, um, you know, if this, if this was your power plant and this is where the water's going in, you'll kind of see like this area around it where there's not a lot of things living there and that's because it's too hot. So back to efficiency. Um, so we can actually increase efficiency. Um, a car with a higher gas mileage is more efficient. An appliance that's going to consume less power, like an energy, um, an energy star appliance, that's going to be more efficient. Um, and so what's great about increasing efficiency is it has the same effect as increasing the energy supply, but it's not going to cost as much. So it's much easier to create a car with a higher gas mileage than to extract or even find more oil sources. Okay, so it's much easier or cheaper to just increase the efficiency of our current appliances rather than um, requiring more energy. So this is something we're really um, kind of getting into, like turning off the lights when we're gone. It's going to increase our efficiency or the compact fluorescents or the LEDs or, you know, the Energy Star appliances or like keeping your refrigerator door closed when it's running, you know, stuff like that. Not just standing in front of the refrigerator looking for food, opening it, getting what you need and get out. Um, so um, if we look at our reserves of um, coal, we have tons of coal. Remember, we, we extract coal, so we have plenty of that. Uh, we even send coal to other places. We have a decent supply of natural gas, but we have very, very few um, petroleum supplies. And you can even see here, um, this upper line is how much oil we use. And the lower line is how much oil we have. So obviously, to make up that gap, we've got to import oil, okay? So whatever this difference is, must be imported. So, and that's, that's where we get into the OPEC stuff and the Middle East and things like that, is because we've got to bridge that gap between how much oil we have and how much oil we use. Um, so how do we make fossil fuels, okay? Why are they called fossil fuels? So fossil fuels are formed from the fossils, which are the remains of living organisms, which happened 100 to 500 million years ago. This isn't like yesterday. It's not even like Benjamin Franklin's time or whatever. It's, it's, it's a long, long time ago. Um, and so what happens is these living organisms um, will, there's a couple ways it can happen. Um, it can be plants or it can be animals. Um, they can die and then they just kind of like get stuck somewhere like they talk about like the tar fields or whatever. Um, and then the detritus will kind of accumulate and it will get buried and then there's lots of time and heat and pressure and it will form these fossil fuel deposits and then we can extract them. Okay. Um, and so we're taking carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere millions of years ago and releasing it now. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why fossil fuels are a huge problem because we're, we're um, using them so fast and they, that carbon has been out of the atmosphere for millions of years and now we're putting it back in. So when we talk about estimated better but versus proven reserves, estimated reserves is like an educated guess as to where oil or natural gas may be located and how much they may be found. So they do like surveys and things like that. And they say, okay, we think there's this much oil or natural gas here. And then a proven reserve is actually how much oil can economically be obtained from an oil field. So this is all probabilities. Um, and what's important to, to note is that economically be obtained. So at some point, 
it gets too expensive to extract the oil. It's going to cost more to get it out than we use, than, than they're going to get for it. And so at that point, they're not going to extract the oil anymore because it's not going to make them enough money. Now, a lot of times some reserves are like, okay, it's too expensive to extract from here. Let's go to a different one. And then the oil prices go up and they say, okay, we can go back to that other one because now we can get a little more oil out of it and we can still make money on it. And then they'll go away from that one. And when oil prices go up again, they can maybe go back to that again. So it's, it's um, they're not going to give something away for free, right? They like to make profits. And so it's how much they can economically get from it. And so um, this pie chart shows proven reserves. And you can see that the Middle East has 65% of the proven oil reserves. And that's why the United States cares so very deeply about what's going on in the Middle East. Because remember, they need to bridge that gap. This is how much oil we use. This is how much oil um, we have. We need to bridge that gap. The Middle East has 65% of the oil reserves. Guess where most of that oil is going to come from? The Middle East. So we need to make sure that um, we know what's going on over there and we are very involved over there and because the United States doesn't want their oil supplies interrupted. Um, so how do we get this out? We call it recovery. Um, and so there's primary recovery, which is just like conventional pumping, but it's only going to get about 25% of the oil. Then we have something called secondary recovery, where we can manipulate the pressure in the reservoir by injecting brine or steam. It's water, right? Um, it's very salty water or just plain water. And that'll give us about 50%. And then enhanced recovery will inject CO2 into the oil reserve and allows oil to um, flow again. These you know, the amount of work it takes, each one is increasingly expensive. So, it, you know, it, depending on the oil prices, it may not be worth it for oil companies to do enhanced recovery because they're not going to make what they get out of it, what they put into it. So let's talk about the economics of um, oil. Um, like I said, oil companies aren't going to spend more money to extract oil than it makes selling it. So if they run out, they're going to increase the price, and then they'll get you'll get more oil available. So this is an interesting little chart. Um, so basically, um, what's interesting is they spend about sixteen thousand dollars an hour lobbying in Washington. So you can see why a lot of politicians are um, very concerned about the oil industry because the oil industry is throwing around $16,000 an hour lobbying politicians for advantages for their companies. Um, a lot of the alternative energy companies or let's say like animals um, or you know the environment, they don't have that money, that much money to spend on lobbying or to influence politicians. Um, so this is this is lunchtime, and it's showing how much uh, carbon has been released in just one day. Um, and they get 6.6 .6 million in tax breaks in a day. And and think about it, right? There, that $16,000 an hour is is good money based on. Um, you know, based on the breaks they get. And it says, like, so far today, they're getting $49.7 uh, million. So in one day, they're getting $342 million in profits. They're producing a billion pounds of carbon pollution. And a CEO is making $60,000. And that's a day, $342 million in profits a day. So $16,000 on lobbying is nothing, right? So we import this oil, right? Um, so in the Middle East, there's a group of countries called OPEC, and they are the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And they, they created this uh, group 
so um, they weren't competing with each other basically for oil. So um, in the 70s, they restrained production to get a higher price, which is what they called the, um, the oil crisis. You may have heard of that. Um, so they, they, they reduced the amount of oil they were producing in order to get um, higher prices, this should be prices. And then when they resumed shipping their oil, they resumed it at four times the previous price. Um, so basically their, their strategy worked. It's, you know, they're the ones that have all the oil, everybody wants it. Um, and the purchase of foreign oil is the single largest factor in our balance of payment deficit. So we're buying more than, we, than we're selling. Hmm. So what happens when oil prices rise? Um, so what did we do in the 1970s as an adjustment to higher oil prices? We increased our domestic production, right? Um, if oil from the Middle East increases in price, it makes it a little more economically feasible to, you know, do maybe secondary or enhanced production or recovery of oil in the United States um, because it's more expensive in the um, Middle East. Uh, we created new standards for auto fuel efficiency. So, okay, cars have to be a little more efficient. So we're using, we're not using so much oil so quickly. Um, they lowered the speed limits because it's been shown that a higher speed limit is going to use more oil. Um, and so they, they reduced the speed limits. And then they created an oil reserve in Louisiana, which has around 33 days of supply. So that's, you know, really super helpful. Um, it's going to last about a month. Um, and then what happens when uh, oil prices fall? Um, when oil prices fall, we stop looking for new oil place, um, places to extract oil because, you know, it's not very, oil is not very expensive. So why bother looking for new places for oil? We stop conservation efforts because why bother? Um, some incentives, we increase the speed limit because, you know, we've got plenty of oil and it's cheap. And then um, any subsidies or tax breaks for energy efficiency also are reduced because why bother? We've got tons of energy. We don't need to bother with things that reduce um, the amount of oil that we use. And so how do we gain oil independence? Um, we have to increase our fuel efficiency. We need to use other fuels to make auto fuel. Okay, and we need to make develop alternatives to fossil fuels. This is how we are going to reduce our efficient um, our our um, dependence on foreign oil. Okay, so this was just like a quick and dirty review of um, energy 